now, here's a Scared for Reals Legacy Special. Hey, Chris O'Neill here. And Adam Perry. Yes, 1949, 75 years of cinema. You and I weren't even thought of back then. Nope. Uh, I don't even think my parents were even thought of back then. <laughs> and it was a year before my father was born, too. Yeah, it was the same my, uh Well, 40, no, my dad was born in 59, so 10 years. Wow. Yeah. And my, my mother-in-law was born in 1949, and my father-in-law was six years old. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so what, a, what an incredible year of film. You know, it's the Academy Awards, if, if, if you still hold clout with them. They chose all the King's Men for Best Picture that year. Which is kind of what we're going through now politically, you know, and that was their best pic- picture of the year was the, all the King's Men, which mm-hmm. they remade it with Sean Penn, not very good. So you had that, you had a letter to three wives, all these schmaltzy kind of, well, except for all the King's Men, which again, it's, it seems like it's dated, but when you watch it, the themes, it's like, wow. So those were, those were like the, the major films of 1949, but we're going to focus on our favorite ones. And the first one I'm going to highlight is not necessarily one of my favorites, but it was interesting because you think of 1949 Japan, America occupied, you know, Japanese at that time. Mm-hmm. So there was a lot of American films being shown over there. But before I go any further, I want to do this while I'm thinking of it. Subscribe. Never miss an episode of Scared for Reels. Just click that uh, subscribe button and you'll get notified whenever we have a new episode that rolls out. And not only that, we're on Instagram, Facebook, X. Our handle is at Scared for Reels. So again, we're talking about 1949 and we're choosing some of the films that we think you should like really pay attention to because there there was some some really awesome films. And actually two of the films... I picked are amongst my top 250 films of all time. Awesome. So The Invisible Man Appears is a Japanese film. And from what I'm seeing here, there's not a lot of information online, but this movie was not available to see outside of Japan until 2021, Adam. Wow. Interesting. Arrow Videos got a hold of it, and they released both that in the sequel, The Invisible Man versus the Human Fly, which came out almost a decade later. But I mean, this is, The Invisible Man appears is from what I understand, the earliest surviving Japanese sci-fi film. And they're they're like examples, they're like really early examples of tokusatsu, which is basically means an emphasis on big special effects. Mm -hmm. And you have... Eiji Tsuburaya. Uh, now, that name, if you're a fan of Godzilla, he is the special effects guy for Godzilla. You know, like literally like five years later, the original Godzilla would be released. And uh, I mean, the guy's known for that, but this was like his early days, if you will. So he was brought in. He did the visual effects, which I mean, for 1949, it was it was pretty cool. Yeah. So I, I think you may feel the same way I do about The Invisible Man Appears. It's not like a masterpiece, but it's kind of interesting. And you'd be happy to know that there's a real Invisible Man in this movie, unlike the the remake that came out four, four or five years ago. Well, I mean, you know, that's awesome. That's great. <laughs> uh, you know, it's... <laughs> um, uh, I have I've yet to uh, to catch this one yet. Um, I'm very interested. I can't wait to see it. It's what do you say? It's on Tubi. Two, yeah, you can it's actually a- watch this on Tubi, and you could probably watch it on YouTube Internet Archive. Um, I have the Arrow Blu-ray, which contains both Invisible Man films in Japan. Um, they're both. I I highly recommend them if you're a fan of the genre. I mean, it's it's not technically a horror movie, Adam. The the plot. Right. You got a gang of thugs. And you've got this uh, this doctor who's really gung ho. Uh, he's got this formula for making living creatures invisible. Mm-hmm. Now the problem is he can't bring them back. You know, so I mean, obviously it's the whole H.G. Wells concept, right? You know, dabbling in things you probably shouldn't be dabbling in, but 
the, this scientist really had no intention of using it on a human being. He really didn't. Mm -hmm. He was testing it on different animals and stuff. And, and perhaps maybe he later tested on a human, but he, he didn't, he was fearful of it because he hadn't found the formula to turn them back into visible beings. They remain invisible until they die and then they reappear again. Just like. It's basically just like the H.G. Wells. Yeah, just like the, the actual yeah. novel. Yeah. So, I mean, it was respectful to the H.G. Wells story and even the H.G. Wells uh, inspired film that came out with Claude Rains that Universal right. did. And they had used kind of the same bandages and outfit for it, too, which very cool nod to, you know, Universal Studios there. Mm hmm. So, well, I mean, I mean, that's even described in the H.G. Wells book. Well, so, yeah, yeah it, you know. So, I mean, that, that's cool. Again, you know, I, I bashed the uh, the Invisible Man remake from a couple of years ago only because uh, there's really no Invisible Man. There, there's, well, I mean, there's an invisible person in it, but yeah. it, it uh, has it's absolutely a, nothing to do with the um, with the H.G. Wells novel right. or the movie it was intending to remake. Right. So, um, I mean, so this has points on that one alone just because right. they're acknowledging some sort of link between that and the the hg wells book yeah they're in the universe at least yeah yeah <laughs> so i mean you you could literally you know imagine that this scientist talked to the scientist in the novel and you know they were yeah amongst the group but yeah this scientist though literally had no plans on using on a human being but these uh gang of thugs Intend to use this invisibility formula. You know, this professor really was was, was kind to the, the guy who heads who paid for these thugs um, is actually like a, a, a museum curator of antiques, mm -hmm. something like that. I mean, that's that's one thing with the plot. It's very thin and kind of convoluted, um, but it's still very fascinating. So it turns into a film noir, Adam, because. That that antique guy hires these thugs to rob this professor of the formula. Okay, mm. so they kidnap the professor because they notice in his notes that okay, well, there is no way to turn them back. So they're hoping that capturing him it might help. So they, they these thugs hire this guy to take the invisible formula, and they they promise, oh, we'll turn you back as soon as uh, you give us the item. And the item in question is this priceless jewel necklace, the Tears of Armor. So the guy, you know, he's actually a protege of this professor. He's got like two protégés, and there's a love triangle in there because the professor has a daughter. They're both eyeing the daughter, and she kind of can't decide between the two. Uh, don't worry. It doesn't end up like the movie Bandits where, oh, I'm going to choose both. Right. Um, that doesn't happen here. Spoiler alert. Uh, and that's just not Japanese culture in itself. Either, right. You know. So there's a love triangle thrown in there. There's film noir. There's a crime story. It's And you get the, this sci-fi horror element kind of dangling in there. Mm -hmm. So it is kind of interesting to use the newspapers and all that kind of stuff, just like a 1940s detective film noir film, you know? Very interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. So the professor's kidnapped, and the professor's, one of his protégés, he's the more ambitious of the two. He takes the invisible formula with the promise, hey, um, not only am I going to be like, a guinea pig here, I'll have an awesome story when I come back because they, they promise you will come back. Mm -hmm. uh, but they kind of hide the the fact that they really don't have a way. They just are just manipulating the guy into doing something knowing that he's never going to be visible again. Yeah. So there's that tragic element to the, to the story as well. And film noirs, you know, if, if it's a film noir, things aren't going to go as planned. No, <laughs> they, no. They never no. do. They never work in the in the, the evil mind's favor. Mm -hmm. They never do. So the other protege, uh, the one who's less ambitious, um, him and the professor's daughter, uh, they, they kind of piece things together and they, you know, go and try to track down these thugs and they find out the museum antique guy is the plot twist. You know, you kind of, there's like a, it, 
the audience knows, but no one else in the story knows. I, there is a, 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 a name for that in, in uh, film theology or whatever. I just can't remember the exact name for it. But So, again, I mean, it's very predictable. You know how this is going to end up. You know, the Invisible Man's going to die. Right. And then he reappears. And none of the, the thugs or the antique guy are going to make it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the, the professor's okay. And, you know, his daughter and the other guy, the other protege of his, both fall in love happily ever after. So, kind of. Yeah. Cause I mean, he, I mean, that guy still has this, the, the formula for becoming invisible. So it's like kind of, is it going to ever happen again? And of course, a decade later, there's the, the sequel versus the human fly. Ha uh-huh. ha. Yeah. A year before the fly actually came out, actually, the original. Really? Yeah. The Interesting. Da- the David Hedison version. Yeah. So that, that I mean, the Visible Man appears. It's it's kind of a cool concept. I mean, obviously, the highlights are the the visible or the special effects, right? Of course, which were, you know, top notch at the time. You watch it now, it's kind of clunky a, a little bit. But I mean, you got to remember, it's 1949. Yeah, I mean, and when you watch it with you know any of these movies um, of that age with, with that con the right, I mean, really shows how amazing, you know. And innovative, uh, the filmmaking was. Yeah, and there was a lot of paranoia too. That's another thing because, you know, this was like four years after World War Two. Yeah, you know, the Cold War. They yeah, the Cold War is starting to form. So I mean, that was a big thing mm-hmm. in the late forties, especially through the fifties, was the the paranoia of the time. Well, the Atomic Age. That's yeah, why. That's, that's why we had the big creature. Yeah. Uh, features. You know, the, and the, five uh, years later, you know, you had uh, Godzilla. Yeah, so. which is the the ultimate atomic bomb, you know, scare, right. you know, uh, type movie. So, and we will be talking about Godzilla later on this year as we as it approaches its seventieth anniversary. So that's that's my first pick. Um, do you want to talk about one of yours real quick? I, well, I, I'm gonna make a confession here. Um, 1949 is a, a very unique year. There's not really any, um, you know. I was shocked at how many movies I hadn't seen from this this year. Well, so, you've got to get on it. Adam. Well, I got to get on. <laughs> um, so, whereas normally uh, we both have a list of five, I only have a list of three. So, Chris, I'm going to defer to you. Let you go with another one, and then I'll hit my first. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, um, uh, before we go further, if you're a fan of horror films, there were a lot of Indian films, and I don't know if any of them exist. You know, because, you know, it's very unfortunate. And I, I know I'm kind of going off course here. But when it comes to Indian cinema, it's very difficult to find them on home video. Right. Unless you get, I mean, there is like an Asian streaming service. And there's, I mean, Netflix has some Indian films. I know RRR was, was big a couple. That's the biggest money-making Indian film, I think, of all time, or at least... In this country, Netflix has some of them. I I just can't remember the name of that Asian streaming service. You can comment below and fill us in on that because I'm kind of going off course here. Well, but, yeah, I mean that. I mean that just goes to show that us Americans we we live in such a bubble, and you know it's so hard to get access to to right. foreign films. I mean, it's getting better with technology, and as time right. goes on, you know, because we're we're surrounded by two oceans. You know, it, 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 you forget sometimes that uh, there's a whole nother other cultures and other art forms right. and other, you know, who did the same thing that we did, but because we're, you know, we're Americans and we don't, you typically step outside our comfort zone. Well, and that's um, the thing, like 20, this was like 20 years ago, I read that there's over a thousand movies made and released every single year sure. throughout the world. Yeah. And America gets access to less than 200 of those. Right. And, I'm sure it's a little bit more now because as much as people hate to admit it, we live in the most inclusive society of ever. We mm-hmm. just, you know, we're not going to get into all that. Yeah, stuff. but I mean, but even still, I mean, like the, the, there's still a lot of films that just do not get released here. Right. Some of them have an anti-American message and will never see the light of day in America. That's just the way it goes. Mm-hmm. And that's why films like Godzilla, the original Japanese version, 
were edited because they were they weren't necessarily critical of America, but everyone that's used the atomic bomb. Let's not forget, yes, America's the only one that dropped it on some other country, but there has been testing in other countries, including Japan. And they were kind of, well, I mean, Japan, they were Japan's the one that got hit. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> you know, and Japan but, yeah. literally tested yeah. like several months before Godzilla got released. Yeah. They let off a, a bomb to test it and it, it killed a couple of fishermen. They were kind of critiquing their own government as well. And of course, in America, they cut that part out of the. That, that the movie. story, yeah, but I, I mean, you know, just to to make you know wrap up the point, but yeah, nineteen forty nine, it, it, it was I, very I, fresh. It, it, it's fresh, and again, you know, we we always talk about our favorite monsters. Without German expressionistic gothic movies, right? We, we don't have those, right? We don't have the Frankenstein's. We don't have the Dracula's. We don't. Right. I mean, um, we've kind of adopted Nosferatu as our own in in our culture, but right. you know. We we got to remember that that came from Germany, right? You know that that's that's not our baby, you yeah. know. And um, which was inspired by an English novel, so <laughs> which was inspired by Dracula. But, yeah, right, you know, right. So, so speaking of uh, English, um, going going to head to the United Kingdom for the the next film. This is like a dark comedy. So if you're into twisted humor, well, you're going to enjoy Kind Hearts and Coronets. You've got. Dennis Price, Joan Greenwood, prominent British actors at the time. But this film is noted for Sir Alec Guinness because he plays uh-huh. eight different roles here. And he literally, wow, he was only supposed to play like two or three roles. He goes, why can't I just play all eight? And yeah. He did. And it, probably one of his most memorable performances. Decades before Star Wars, de- like a decade before The Bridge on the River Kwai, yep. which would win him his Oscar. Unlike those two movies, this one, this is a role he wanted. This is a role he relished. And you can tell. Yeah. You know, he he's a supporting character, but and actually one scene he almost drowned. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah. But this is uh, Ealing Studios. Are you familiar with that studio, Adam? Oh uh, no. No, they were prominent in in this time frame. They made a lot of interesting period pieces and it, it kind of you can kind of see where Hammer got some inspiration. Mhm. Uh, it's from Ealing Studios. And just so you know, um Will Barker bought the White Lodge on Ealing Green in 1902 as a base for filmmaking, and films have been made on that site ever since. It's like the one of the oldest. I think it is the oldest continuously working studio ever. Oh, wow. Ealing Studios. The head of Ealing Studios, Michael Balkin. He was the head and the producer of Kind Hearts and Coronets, and he uh, got Robert Hamer as the director, and it took place September of 48, and they literally filmed at Leeds Castle and other locations in Kent, and I mean, they, they shot a lot of the interior shots, of course, at Ealing Studios. Kind Hearts and Coronets was released in June of 1949, well-received. It's got, like, favorable reviews over the years. It's one of the cult favorites. I mean, it was a pretty massive box office success at the time. Mm-hmm. It's just, you know, Al Guinness's other roles kind of were more prominent, like the Lady Killers, which would come out a few years later, also at Ealing Studios. Yep. And there was a lot of movies that Al Guinness specifically made at Ealing Studios. So basically, in case you're not familiar with it, uh, it follows Lewis Dascoin Mazzini. He's the 10th Duke of Chalfont. He's in prison awaiting his hanging for murder the following morning. And he's writing his memoirs. You know, that's that's the means of flashback in the... Yeah. You know, and basically his mom was the youngest daughter of the seventh Duke of Chalfont, and he lo- and and basically she eloped with an Italian opera singer. That that didn't sit very well with the Das Coins. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they kind of disowned her, disavowed her, and when she passed away, they refused to have her buried on site. They kind of ignored Lewis's pleas to, hey, can I have my mom buried mm-hmm. where, you know, in her family plot and. They kind of ignored her, so he vows to get revenge and kill each and every one of them. So he can get his own rights to everything. So kind of a way, he becomes kind of greedy and selfish, but in in his heart, he's doing it for his mom. I mean, you're probably, it's like, this doesn't sound like a comedy, but it's it, the way it's handled in the script. And Lewis leaves for school. His mom actually writes to her kinsman, the Lord Ascoin, Das coin, say that three times fast, who's a private banker. And he's actually the nicest out of all the Das coins. And again, played by Al Guinness. Mm-hmm. So Al Guinness plays an old man. He plays a young, goofy 
kind of guy. He plays a woman, plays like a hoity, snotty, hoity-toity guy, and he plays part of a, a captain, a, like a headstrong, oblivious captain. I mean, he literally sinks with the ship, and that's what, the, what I was telling you about. He almost drowned. Mm-hmm. This is quite the, the film if you ever get a chance to watch it. So he resolves to kill all of them. He arranges a fatal boating accident for Ascoin Dascoin, who's kind of a, he's the snobby one, but he's also kind of clueless. He literally sets it up for uh, him and it's either his girlfriend or his fiance, and they're like just chilling in a boat, ah, da, da, and they go over the, the edge and drown. All righty. And, and we're sitting here laughing again. It doesn't sound like it's a comedy, does it? No. But it is. Yeah. And it's the way that it's handled in the so movie. Execution. The execution, the script. Yeah. It's very witty script. Yeah. And then his next target is a, a that, that amateur photographer guy, and he's kind of uh, very clueless, oblivious. He's so focused on his hobby and nothing else. Kind of just keeps going on in, in that fashion. And then in between all of this, he's he's in love with this, this woman who's never in love with him. By the, the time this woman loves him, it's too late, you know? Wow. Because he's already arranged a marriage to one of the spouses of the guy he murdered. Mm-hmm. Because he, he knows he'll it'll look good for him to be the Duke if he has a prominent wife. Yeah. So, and he vows to get that inheritance. And, it, well, he does get it, but, you know, he's going to get arrested for it. And he gets set up and and then in jail. It, it, it's a very f- funny ending, Adam. So, mm. he literally is freed. He's ready to go. And then... um you know, he, uh, they're like, oh, you, you've got quite the story to tell. And he realizes he left his memoirs in the, in the jail. And mm-hmm. that's how the movie ends. Yeah. So it's like he's going to get busted because he just confessed to all of the murders. Right. So it, it's very interesting. I, I, I'm leaving out some stuff. This is a movie you really should see. I mean, I know I'm kind of spoiling it, but at the same time, I'm leaving some other things out. So when you watch it, you'll, you'll be just enthralled in it because it's it's a, a wonderfully written story it's not a hundred percent but i mean it, it couldn't like have certain themes in the movie be too obvious because of the censors and all that kind of stuff because mm-hmm. some of the subject matters kind of raises eyebrows they even dropped the n-word a couple times in there that oh. had nothing to do with the color of skin though because if you look up the real definition of the word it doesn't mean dark skin you know what i mean it's also this is uh, made in great britain yeah, I yeah. Mean, words mean different things in different nations and different. Like I'm gonna smoke. I'm gonna smoke a. F- that's it's a cheap piece of wood. You know, yeah, right. it had nothing to do with preferences. You know, right? It's just such a great dark comedy, yeah. and if you have a dark, twisted sense of humor, like I know you do sometimes, Adam. Uh, I um, I go there sometimes. Yeah. Yes. This is definitely worth watching. Yeah. And, and again, if you're a fan of Al Guinness, this is like a no-brainer. This is like his first real breakout role. Mm-hmm. And then later on, you know, he would, uh, you know, he'd even do The Holiday. Remember that movie uh, that Queen Latifah was in? It was a remake of the Al Guinness classic. Right. And then, of course, Lady Killers. I mean, I'm going to forget about the Coen Brothers' abysmal remake. Right. Hey, I mean, you can't beat the original Ealing Studios production of The Lady Killers. That's We'll talk about that one at a different time. Right. So that that's that's my pick. Uh, you know, 1949, Kind Hearts and Coronets. They just released, Studio Canal just released a beautiful 4K restoration. So, I mean, if you're a fan of that, you, I think the limited edition is sold out, but they've got the standard one that you can get. I mean, I have the Criterion DVD, and that's long out of print. Right. But I'm, I'm sure you can find it on some sort of streaming platforms. I'm not into streaming that much, so I I don't pay attention to that. But I know you can you can pretty much watch any movie somewhere online. Yeah. That's what I've come to the cl- conclusion on. So, yeah, Kind Hearts and Coronets is a, a must-watch from 1949. Very cool. So, do you want to talk about one of yours? Yes, yes. All right. So, uh, we're, you know, you're at your third pick. So, I'll start with my first pick. And uh, we're going to do something a little different, Chris. We're going to talk about something that, uh, or, or a, a form of uh, storytelling that we haven't talked before yet on this. And we're going to, that is the serial. Yes. All right. So, for those of you don't who don't know, before television, before everybody had the, the little glowing box in there, 
Um, there was <laughs> a ep- glowing box, a little glowing box in, in your living room. <laughs> yes. Um, that, that, that told you what to do. <laughs> um, y- you could watch episodic stories at the theater, at, at the theater. Yes. Um, you would go every week and you would get a 17 to 25 minute short story. Then you go back the next week, catch the next yes. uh, part of it. And, um, in 1949, we got. Batman and Robin. Mm. Uh, this, um, this is a sequel by Columbia Pictures um, to their original serial called Batman from 1943. Right. But this is uh, this is the more famous of the two serials. Right. Um, this is... Um, again, more people talk about it. More people know about it. Yeah. More people talk about it. Um, and it's our first... You know, live one of our first live action looks at Batman and Robin. How many? We, how many do they have in this uh, series? There's 15 episodes. Nice. In, the, in this series, that was typically they usually had between 15 and 20. Yeah, and yeah. Um, I mean, this was before Superman. This was before, uh, right? Because I think a year or two later we'd get the first Superman yeah, serial. With George, but, uh, but, George, but yeah, I mean, yeah. like, so this is really cool. This is one of the very first times uh, we get to see in real life um, our favorite comic book heroes. Uh, duking it out Mm -hmm. um so we had um again from columbia pictures it's a 15 chapter serial um with robert lowry playing batman Mm. johnny duncan playing robin and supported by jane adams as vicky vale um for those of you the 89 movie adams yeah Yeah, um from those of you who like the 89 movie that's same character vicky right and then um a veteran character actor larry uh, lyle talbot as commissioner gordon Mm-hmm. Um, so now, was, was Lowry also in the 1943 Batman, or did they have no? No, else? this is a totally different cast from okay. the 1943. Gotcha. Um, so uh, the plot is very simple, Chris. Uh, we oh, don't have, have a we don't have a very uh, familiar um, classic Batman villain, but um, basically the dynamic duo uh, faces off against the Wizard. The wizard. <laughs> yes, he's a he's a hooded villain with an electronic device that remotely controls vehicles, and um, it uh, compulses them to you know, like just. I, I know it's it's kind of weird. It, it's a device that just electronically controls can control anything. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. There, there was a lot of new technology coming out around the time, so the, it kind of was yeah making a statement about that. And were, was there any like? like villains from the actual comic book because the comic uh, book was fresh because yeah. that just came out i think it was 39 or 40 the original uh batman the batman number one comes out um 38 38 okay so i knew it was around 38 or 39 yeah and robin is introduced in like uh 39 or 40 right um so I got the two confused. I do remember Robin being introduced in thirty nine. Yeah, because okay, yeah. super, so nineteen thirty eight. Super, Superman comes out in thirty eight, and then like at by the end of the year of thirty eight or thirty nine, early thirty nine is when Batman comes right. out. Right. Right. Um, but that's just it. So you, you got this wizard guy with this electronic device that can, can remotely control vehicles and just about anything he wants, and you got Batman and Robin trying to stop him in fifteen chapters of excitement. Nice. Well, that's <laughs> yeah. interesting because the wizard wasn't even a comic book villain, as no. far as I know. No. Um, I do which, remember which, in one of the early uh, Batman comic books, they had uh, the Calendar Man, which was kind of weird, but it was it was very interesting. Yeah, the wizard, huh? Yeah. Interesting. Um, you know, fun notes like there is no Batmobile. Yeah. Um, this uh, even though the Batmobile was you know prominently featured in the comics. Uh, this is a, a limousine driven by Alfred, and they just kind of get changed into their costumes in the back of the limousine and jump out and go do their thing. Right. Um, and the they drive around in a 1949 Mercury, you know, to, to do their investigations. Crazy about a Mercury. <laughs> yes. Um, so I it's it's a fun little uh, series uh, for any Batman fan or. Um, if you're just looking to watch something different, you know, some, you know, educate yourself on the evolution of cinema and, um, you know, just so you know, the, the, the serials were around from the silent era to like, yeah. the early fifties. Yeah. And there, there was some, some like 
interesting ones with uh, Les Vampires or whatever it was mm -hmm. over in France. Uh, that was a prominent one that's getting a physical media release. I know some of these, I think they've been starting to release a lot of these Batman like early animated films and um, also I think some of the serials are available on home video I believe. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I was just going to get to that in uh, um, 2014. The entire serial was, was released on DVD and then uh, with the help of Turner Classic Movies they actually broadcast the entire serial um, uh, from October to January um, of uh, 2021 to 2022. Nice. Um on uh, TMC, so it, it it's there. It, it's it's celebrated. I mean, uh, the the superhero genre is alive and kicking right now. So um, yeah, especially if you're a fan of Batman, because there is a Batman movie, I believe, coming out in the next year the, or two. A couple of them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you got the sequel to the Batman. Yeah, uh, coming out, and then uh, James Gunn has his own Batman in the works. So there's a lot of Batman coming out, but this is one of the first. Yes. Um, so, and again, something a little different than uh, sitting down for 90 minutes and watching a movie. You you get 15 to 20 minutes of uh, a little taste of something. You right. Know, and, and each episode played out um, exactly the same. You, you know, you'd open up, villains doing something bad, Batman and Robin figure it out. Then you Leave get it a, out of a cliffhanger. Yeah, you, you get a little action scene and then, you know, yeah, a cliffhanger and then you know, what happens next week. You right. Know. And you could probably binge through that in a, in a day. Uh, yeah. You know. Easily. No, so. that's, it's cool. The serials were, a, were a lot of fun and I, I don't have any serials in my collection, but that one would uh, be kind of a cool one to have. Yeah. So 1949, we're going to step away from the horror genre. Adam kind of led into the crime world. Mm -hmm. Another uh, big thing, again, we're going to talk about film noirs here, and this one's more of a, a gangster-related film. Adam, I, I know you love your gangster cinema. Yep. Well, this is one that I would highly recommend you watch. Again, there's a lot of typical gangster stuff that you would see in a Warner Brothers picture, because ga gangsters and Warner Brothers in the late 30s into the 40s were kind of synonymous with each other. They were noted for their their raw gangster films mm -hmm. you know and probably the most prominent gangster in the 30s and 40s was none other than james cagney and james cagney i know i've said this before people you know john travolta likes to think of himself as james cagney but i think as far as our generations and the past generations are concerned christopher walken kind of mirrors James Cagney's career to a T. Because let's face it, James Cagney, you think of tough guy gangster pictures, right, Adam? Yep. Yep. Christopher Walken, psychopath, gangster guy. So, But the thing is, both of them are song and dance men. James Cagney loved to sing and dance. And unfortunately, he only got to do it in three movies. He didn't even get a handful of musicals. There was one movie where Doris Day was the singer, but he didn't do any dancing. He was the Gimp. That was his gangster nickname, the Gimp. Mm -hmm. This gangster who bankrolls a singer's career and everything. But James Cagney was, you, you want to talk about barrel full of energy. This, this guy, and he had a rough time with Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's face it, Public Enemy, the Roaring Twenties, he... He had so many prominent tough guy gangster pictures in that small time frame, you know, the early 40s. But he he wanted to get out of it. So uh, he did, you know, after winning an Oscar for Yankee Doodle Dandy, again, that was one of three movies where he was able to sing and dance. And after that, he left Warner Brothers to form his own production company, along with his bu business manager and brother, William. And his brother actually helped him out throughout his whole career, even with Warner Brothers. Yep. Like, there was a lot of times where James Cagney thought a script was really bad. He would just ad-lib the, the part and and actually make more memorable dialogue, mm -hmm. believe it or not. So, unfortunately, though, <laughs> it wasn't very successful for him. He He made four films with his production company, 
All of them were, were, were failures. They're unsuccessful, to say the least. So he returned to Mor- Warner Brothers again in mid-1949, and he was only thinking about money. <laughs> yeah. Because he had lost a lot of money on those four films that he did. I mean, one of them was actually critically acclaimed. It was The Time of Your Life, but no one's ever heard of that movie now because it was a huge disaster. I mean, the critics liked it, mm-hmm. but it didn't go anywhere at the box office. And he never forgot the hell that Warner put him through in the 1930s. But, and, and that's another thing. Uh, you thought James Cagney, you know, hated going back to Warner. But Warner himself literally said he, he never wanted to, to see Cagney on his lot ever again. He referred to him a lot as that little bastard. No, <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> so there's a lot of... A lot of tension, as you can imagine, coming back to Warner Brothers for Cagney. But Cagney did get a new contract, which enabled him to make, at the time, $250,000. That was a lot of money in 1949. And he had to do, like, one film per year. Plus, he had script approval and the opportunity to develop projects for his own company. So, to make good on his comeback, Cagney settled on the script for White Heat which uh, got released on May 6th. He played Arthur Cody Jarrett. Uh, and Jack Warner, of course, didn't like it. <laughs> oh, of <laughs> course. Just, yeah. yeah, he just didn't like it. So it, this was actually based on a real gangster, uh, uh, this this murderer named Francis Crowley. Uh, he was like, uh, went on a killing spree in 1931. Oh, wow. Yeah, before his execution... His last words were, send my love to mother. The interesting thing about the Cody Jarrett character in White Heat, he has a fascination with his mother, and it's very weird and Mm -hmm. twisted. He only thinks of what benefits his mother. Hmm. Kind of echoes, it's it's just not something you'd see in a gangster film, and in any gangster film. I've never seen a gangster film with a fascination on mother. There was a fascination with Sister with a decade earlier with Scarface. Yeah. Which I believe that was another Warner. No, that was Universal. So it, it made for an interesting dynamic. And this Cagney had never been a, a more vulnerable gangster before. I mean, most of his gangsters were pure tough guy. There was nothing vulnerable about any of his characters. Hmm. Uh, this one, he's very vulnerable. So he has to deal with uh, these ex-cons when he gets out of prison. You know, this is like a typical, you know, ex-con. He gets out of jail. They rob a, a mail train. That's how the movie starts. And he kills literally four members of the train's crew. And I don't, he didn't really want to kill them, but yeah, he had some really inexperienced ones calling each other by name and, they remembered the, the, some of the, the, the work crew, like literally, hey, Cody, don't worry. We won't tell anybody. Oh, you got a good memory for names, huh? <laughs> Too good. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the dialogue is right. very memorable. So after that, you know, they, they Cody has these migraines, okay? He's like sharp, piercing migraines. His dad was was institutionalized. He was crazy. And mm-hmm. he suffers from the same thing. He has these constant pains in, right. in his head. And they hide out in the mountains where it's really cold. And he's married to this this uh, woman who's very memorably portrayed by Virginia Mayo. She was like a prominent blonde actress from like the 40s into the late 50s. Mm-hmm. And she usually played these, like, unsatisfied, like, spouses. Like, she was memorably, uh, probably most people kind of link her to the the best picture winner of 1946, The Best Year of Our Lives, which is probably the most, one of the most honest movies about coming home from fighting in a war. It was, Mm -hmm. like, fresh after World War II. And Virginia Mayo's character is just, you know, she wants to live the high life and she's just kind of selfish. 
her characters are always very selfish in, in, in movies in the 40s, and this is just another example of that. I and mean, she had worked with uh, she worked with James Cagney like a few times, but this is probably their most memorable pairing. Mm-hmm. You know, she's got kind of a, a thing on the side with one of his guys who has higher ambitions of taking over uh, the crew. You know, mm-hmm. you know how the, these yeah. gangster things yeah. play out. Yeah, you know, but the way it, the way this this film rolls is 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 totally it has a totally different vibe. And it's because of James Cagney's just magnetic performance. I mean, he's just like, he does something in, in each scene that surprises the hell out of you. Mm-hmm. So he's got all these migraines. He's got this m- mother issues. I mean, he's like obsessed with his mom and his mom's obsessed with him as well, which is very weird. But uh, she takes care of him when he has these migraines. She, she kind of runs the gang. That's the interesting thing. It's yeah. not really him. It, she's like the glue, okay, and and everyone kind of behind their his back is kind of like uh, he's got the mother thing, you know. It's like it's kind of like a his um what what's the expression uh the weak link or whatever. You know what I'm trying to yeah, say? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, their their thing is they whenever his mom and and her have a toast, they both say top of the world. And then the gang splits up. Informants enable the authorities to close in on a motor court in L.A. where not only Cody and his wife and his mom are held up, but uh, they, 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 try to, they try to do another robbery here, and it just doesn't go out very well. As you know, film noir. Of course, yeah. Crime film noir. Cody shoots, wounds a U.S. Treasury investigator, makes his escape. He then puts his emergency scheme into motion, confessed to a lesser crime committed by an associate in Springfield. So the crime his associate committed, he's going to take the fall for that. So he does some sort of jail time, but to, to make it look good, you know, right. to take uh, the the focus away from all the bigger crimes he's committed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so after robbing the U.S. Treasury, you know, and killing, you know, you know, potentially killing some more people, he decides to take the the rap for a smaller crime, and he turns himself in. He sentenced one to three years in state prisons. However, um, the U.S. Uh, dep- uh, the, the the U.S. justice system has put a mole inside the prison, an mm. undercover detective, undercover agent, and he's going to befriend. Cody, gain his trust, and then he's going to bust him. Yeah. So they, they plant the undercover agent in there. His task is to find the traitor, a fence who launders stolen money for Cody. And on the outside, the, the ambitious right-hand man takes charge. His wife betrays Cody, joins him, obviously. And then his, uh, his right-hand man, Big Ed is the guy's nickname, he hires some of the inmates to kill Cody in there. Well, that doesn't obviously doesn't go as planned. Right. (laughs) But, um, so all that is happening and, and then, uh, big Ed does something else. That's pretty, uh, that's going to set Cody over the edge and he kills his mom. (laughs) Right. And and it's kind of like, Oh, she died of old age or something like that. No, he shot her in the back. Mm -hmm. Come to find out. So I know I'm revealing the plots here, spoiling it for you, but I mean this is a movie 75 years old. I, you know, I I'm not I'm kind of relaxed on the spoiler alert for that. But. Right. So he obviously when he finds out his mom is murdered, he has a huge fit in the prison. You know, mm-hmm. he assaults a cop and he's diagnosed with having homicidal psychosis and is recommended for transfer to an asylum. So this is all part of his plan to get the hell out of there. So the undercover agent and there's a couple of other guys that are with him. They plan the escape and and then of course Big Ed and Verna are kind of awaiting for his uh, return as well. But uh, you know it's kind of like he he's kind of onto this by now. He kind of senses that his wife has always been kind of not faithful, right? So there's all of this stuff that goes on, and it all leads 
to why well, like a big big crime. They're they're going to try to rob the payroll office and they're using an empty tanker truck and all that kind of stuff. And it all leads to this this wicked wicked chase and they they get on top of the like the the, the gas storage tanks. That's where the the climax takes place. So mm-hmm. things go wrong, things are going to blow up. And that's where I'm I'm sure you remember that big famous line at the end. Yeah, White Heat is not only memorable for that one famous line, but I mean James Cagney's performance. And it's so funny, Adam, how you you look at a movie, you think it's like a masterpiece, but uh, the actors and the filmmakers involved uh, feel don't feel the the same way about it. Like James Cagney. He said he found it to be a good picture on a number of levels in his 1985 memoir, mm-hmm. but he kind of thought of it at a time as another cheap jack job because of its limited shooting schedule and the studio's decision to put everybody in it they could for six bits. That's what he said. Yeah. Um, Cagney was particularly irritated by the fact that he pressed them to cast his old friend Frank McHugh in a small role of Tommy in order to bring a touch of humor but according to the star, Warners repeatedly agreed to do it, putting Cagney off until the first day of shooting when he was told McHugh wasn't available. Cagney found out later that McHugh had never been asked. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, they were good friends and everything, but it's just interesting how you look at a film, it's highly revered, it's considered one of the greatest movies of its genre, of its time, and and at the time it was just another, okay, we got to make some money here, so let's just churn it out but yeah thanks to Cagney's just timeless performance I mean this movie will always have a timeless feel to it Adam yeah because of James Cagney's performance so highly recommend White Heat I'm you know I don't think they've released a 4k of this but you can get it on Warner Archive the Blu-ray the DVD is still available too and I'm sure you can watch it somewhere hopefully they release a nice presentation of this sometime soon you'd think 75th anniversary we'd see something good for this you would hope so and we'll be back with part two of 1949 coming up soon scared for reals so comment below tell us your favorite from 1949 if you have one or if you got suggestions and you know you want us to talk about something else we take requests as well don't we adam yes we do so let us know what you think comment below subscribe reach out to us through facebook twitter x We're at Scared for Reels. Scared for Reels. We'll see you soon.